Good morning, friends. Welcome to the worship of God at Wallingford Presbyterian Church. I want to thank all of you for making a liar out of me. Because I told Pastor Taylor, you know there's going to be about 10 people in church today. Because it's Labor Day weekend, everybody's going to be away. Um, but I'm glad that you're here, and I'm glad that we have been gathered by, by God to come to this place as a community of faith um, so that we can walk this journey uh, together. So take a look at all the different announcements that are printed in the bulletin. Um, you may have noticed that the chairs have arrived. <laughs> I'm glad that you pew sitters found a pew to sit in. Uh, like I told you a couple of weeks ago, it may not be your pew, but just imagine that what we did when we reconfigured the sanctuary was we found your pew and moved it to the place where you're now sitting in that pew. So it actually is your pew. It's just moved a little bit. So, you know, use that imagination. Anyways, I hope that uh, uh, you remember why we're doing this, and that is so that we can open our sanctuary, retrofit it, so that uh, it can be, uh, so that people of uh, all abilities can uh, participate in our worship services. Um, Today is the first Sunday of the month, and so we celebrate our September birthdays. Would you identi self-identify if you were born in the month of September? <laughs> I know there's more of you there because our daughter's here and she's not raising her hand, so. <laughs> um, all right, so there are words that are uh, not not familiar words, but the tune is familiar to all of us, shall we wish? our friends in Christ, a happy birthday. And just a reminder that next week is rally day. We'll have a food truck here. The meeting of the congregation will take place so that we can elect a new slate of officers. It's going to take about five minutes for us to do that. Uh, it'll be a part of the worship service. And then um, hopefully we'll have a pretty day. Uh, and we'll move out to the courtyard and enjoy some fellowship with one another. An uh, important day for the kids. There'll be a blessing of the backpacks. There'll be Bibles available for them. So um, we hope to see you all. Um, we hope to see you all next week as well. Cindy, would you lead us in our call to worship? Good morning, everybody. Morning. The God of our ancestors calls us to worship. Praise, Praise God. Lord. Sing a song of thanksgiving. For the Lord dwells among the people. The glory of God abides with us. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Let us worship God with joy. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. God of mystery and might, whose wonderful works are to be remembered, move in our lives as we worship together this morning. Change our minds. Soften our hearts, direct our feet, that we may follow you more faithfully. Yes, Lord, we seek to follow Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. I invite you to stand for our opening hymn.
friends, please be seated. So you'll notice in the bulletin that um, there is a uh, musical response that we'll be using in our prayer today. So when you hear uh, one of the worship leaders say, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer, uh, what you'll be responding with is this uh, musical refrain. Let us come to the Lord in prayer. O oh God of healing, cross and resurrection, we rejoice in hope, even as we wait for the end of suffering and persevere in our prayers. Pray with us now, incline your ear as we bring our lives before you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. we try to bless those who persecute us, make us aware of others facing pure persecution and of the ways in which we persecute others. May the suffering that emerges from our har harassing others come to a swift and certain end. As we rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep, Make us present to the full humanity of those we walk alongside. May those who live in the complex reality of joy mixed with sorrow not be pushed to claim one or the other, but may we all discover how to embody our full emotions while remaining open and receptive to the emotions of others as we attempt to live in harmony with one another. Make us mindful of those often neglected in attempts to balance the scales, or those who are asked to bear the greater burden of that balance. May the wisdom of those less heard be woven into the fabric of our communities, even as those of us who get more attention discern the wisdom of humility and listening. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we refrain from repaying anyone evil for evil, make us conscious of the root causes of evil in our world. May we work together not only to treat the symptoms of evil, but also to address the conditions that make evil possible. As we seek to live peaceably with all, make us alive to the full possibilities of peace. Not just the absence of conflict, but the presence of justice and an environment where all can flourish. May we look for all the ways that your peaceable kingdom is already at work in our world. Oh God, we lift up to you our prayers for situations both near to us and far away, knowing that you hear us and call us to find ways to respond. 
Now, in this moment of quiet, we lift them up to you, trusting that you lovingly hear us. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Lord, we pray for our friends, our friends who are in need. God, we lift up all the victims of war and victims of gun violence. We pray that you'd be with all those who serve and have served in our armed forces. We thank you, Lord, for your abiding care. All these things we pray, saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. And friends, now it's our time for young disciples, so I invite any children who are with us to come forward for a little story. We're a small group today. You're right, but we are mighty, aren't we? Yes. Yes. Okay, we have a little book. Okay. That's right. Because nothing looks like God. This is by Lawrence Kushner. Very interesting. Let's see what it has to say, right? Okay. Where is God? With us. With us. I love that. Maybe I'll have you guys answer before we read the book. And don't assume that the book is the only right answer. This is just one way of phrasing it, okay? So it says, where is God? God is in the beginning, in the first red ripening tomato and cookies fresh from the oven, in the first fun day of vacation, and in the tiny hands of a baby. Where is God? God is in the end, too. In the last sweet bite of birthday cake and in your worn, torn baby blanket, in the last wave goodbye to the end of the visit and the closing moments of someone's life. <laughs> God is in the way people come together, in the sharing of a cold and gloomy morning, in the Band-Aid fix-up after a fall, in the homemade gifts made of clay and paint, and in the morning hugs and goodnight kisses. Where is God? God is everywhere, if only we look. God is wherever we let God in. Yeah, so basically that would mean God is in the floor, which would, which is kind of a weird thing to say, but. Um. Sure, no, absolutely. God it could be anywhere that we are, right. Like cool breezes on a hot summer night, or the rays of sun drying puddles in the rain, like the long hours until supper time, or the short minutes of the day at the beach, you know they are there, but there is something that you can't quite see. Like kindness in someone's voice, or the happiness in a song, you can't see it, but it's there. Like the pride when mom or dad helps in your class, or the jumpy excitement at the start of a holiday, you know it's there, but there's nothing to see. Well, I was talking to Mr. Bob before the service, and he was saying, I was showing him the book, and he said something interesting. He's like, maybe there's nothing to see with our eyes, right? But we can tell with our hearts. I really like that. Yep. Okay. Okay. 
Hold on, I might have to flip a few pages because this is a very long book. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. God doesn't look like anything either because there is nothing really to see. But everyone and everything gives us clues that God is here. Clues that point to the one we cannot see. This is great. How does God make things happen? What do you guys think first? I don't How know. does God make things happen? Mm -hmm. um, well, first of all, he's really good or that, like, making everything look natural. Mm -hmm. Like, mm. Yeah, good like at making you, like you see a hill everything look... Like, mm -hmm. like, you see a hill and it looks, it looks like... like mm. I understand, yes. Okay, so this book is saying, look at your school. A boy helps when another can't reach. A girl shares her lunch. Watch how everyone shows the swings to a new friend. Look at your own town. One family gives money for people who lost their home. A neighborhood gathers books for a children in the hospital. Watch how everyone helps a family with a new baby boy, right? So how does God make things happen? Oh, this is the best page of all. How does God make things happen? Look in the mirror. See. Can you visit someone who feels lonely or pick up trash on the playground? There's no mirrors in here. I don't see anything. That's true. There's no mirrors in here. I should have brought one. That would have been great. We would have yeah. looked in the mirror. Yeah. yeah. We would have been able to look in the mirror. Yeah, I should. Maybe next time. Can you and your friends collect toys for children who have none? With little hands, with big hands, with young hands and old hands. With your hands. Yes, you have a little hand. I have like a, a 10 year old hand. I love it. You have a 10 year old hand, right? Exactly like that. This is how God makes things happen little hands, big hands, young hands, old hands, with your hands. That's hands, a hands, 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 hands. Very powerful message. And that's how it ends. I think this is a wonderful message for all of us. That's how God makes things happen. There was one book that, there was one page you didn't read. Mm hmm. I had to skip a few, I know. But it's all in the same theme, that God works through us, right? And even if we can't see God, we can feel him through the acts of love and service that we can do for others and that they can do for us. And we know that he's here with us. Yeah, like, like, I know where God is right now. He's like right here. I don't actually know if he's right there, but he's somewhere. Sure, exactly. He, in this room. Mm -hmm. In this room. He just said that God is here in this room, even if we can't see him. Amen to that. You should preach this Sunday. I love that. That was great. Hey, <laughs> All right. So. Yeah. I, I should, yeah, that. I should be a pastor. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay. Well, how about we close with an echo prayer? Does that sound good? Okay. okay. So you can repeat after me and our friends in the congregation can help. Let's pray. Dear God. Dear God. Even though we can't see you. We know you're always with us. Help us to use our own hands to fulfill your mission in the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Great job. You did so great. And you were so great. I love it. Okay, so you can head off to your video room, okay, if you'd like to. Mm -hmm. Where's the video room? Out here. If you
By the power of your spirit, O oh Lord, make your word become a joy to us and the delight of our hearts. Amen. A reading from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. I invite you to listen for the word of God today for you. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast what is good, love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, preserve in prayer, persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not cl claim to be a wiser than they are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought of what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Cindy. Our next reading comes from the Gospel according to Matthew. Chapter 16, verses 21 through 28. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord. This must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told the disciples, If any of you want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So I just want to comment on the two scripture passages before us today, and then I want to talk about communion because we haven't done that in, uh, in a while. We've been working through, I've been working through, Pastor Taylor's been working through the letter to the Romans, and 
You might remember that this is a letter that Paul writes to a community where he's never been. So the letter is a letter of introduction. It's a theological um, treatise of what he believes, what he holds to be true, and it's preceding uh, what he hopes will be his visit to the community uh, in Rome. Um, theologians have made uh, the letter to the Romans um, terribly difficult to understand when in fact it really was not written that way. But because of what we do as theologians, we try to nitpick and you know, f split hairs and find all that stuff. But as I was reminded recently in, in a book by a couple of theologians who were writing about their letter to the Romans, it was meant to be shared with a community of faith of people who were artisans and workers and all of that, so they didn't have degrees in theology, so it was never meant to be uh, taken that way. And so if you approach the letter with that in mind, it becomes a very personal and approachable letter. The other thing that I was reminded with Romans is that it's written to a community of faith. I know that, you know, as Christians, we're told, go out into the world, make disciples of everybody, and, you know, the task becomes almost oppressive, right? To think that we have the weight of the world on our shoulders, that it's up to us to make sure that everybody's saved and that is going to go to heaven. That's not who Paul was writing to. Paul was writing to a particular community of Christians, like the community of Christians gathered here at Wallingford Presbyterian Church. He's writing to people who are living their lives day in and day out with one another. I hope you were listening to, to what Cindy just read. Those are very personal words to a community of friends who know each other. And Paul is saying, this is how you live your life with one another, caring for one another, being immersed in each other's lives. Yes, you need to also pay attention to those people who are persecuting you, as the Christians would soon be. I'm not going to get into that. But, but the thrust of the letter is not about the universality of the gospel, but how it plays itself out within the context of a worshiping community how you treat the person who's sitting next to you in your pew. Not just on Sunday morning, but during the rest of the week, how you look out for one another, how you care for one another, how you pray for one another. That's what Paul was getting at. How are you living your faith with those who are around you? I sometimes get so mad at you when I'll go and visit and I'll say, you know, um, why don't, you know, oh, I, I, I don't want to bother anybody by having them stop to pick me up to go to church. What do you think this is all about? <laughs> We're supposed to be bothered. We're actually supposed to be bothered with one another, with walking that journey with, with one another. Oh, don't, fix, don't bother fixing a meal because I can't do it myself. No, that's exactly why we're here. That's part of what living in community is supposed to be about, to be there with and for each other. Matthew. Boy, that's a tough one, right? Can you just feel the weight of those words? Pick up your cross and follow me. Ah, the cross is so heavy. He's not asking us to go to Golgotha. He's already done that. He's not asking us to be Jesus the Christ. He's asking us to be disciples, to pick up the cross, our cross, our communal cross with one another. What are the things that we can be doing individually and corporately to bring about this sense of the good news in the world? And we begin by living out that reality within the context of our community. Do we forgive one another? Because if we forgive one another, then we can be an example for the world looking out, looking in, and lead by example. Do we love one another? Are we carrying each other's burdens? If we do that for one another, then it'll blossom and bloom and bubble up 
and the rest of the world will see that we are Christians by our love. Do you follow me? So the cross is not meant to be this incredible burden that we are nailed to. That's been done, and it's not us. But how do we carry our cross for justice, for peace, for equality in the world, for those who have nothing when we have so much? How do we carry that cross and follow Jesus? Again, Jesus is addressing a community, a community of disciples, those people who were following him. We're not meant to walk this journey alone. We are meant to be in a place like this every Sunday morning. And I'll tell you, it's a little scary to me because I think our worlds are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And pretty soon, our entire world will be us and our phone. That'll be the extent of the society, of the group, of the community. Oh, there's a community out there but it's not the same. It's not the same as sitting next to a person, a living, breathing, warm individual who's sitting next to you and walking that journey with them. Okay, communion. So you know I grew up as a Roman Catholic and uh, you also know that we're not Catholic. And that's not judgment. That's just an observation. But clearly the way that uh, the Roman church approached communion was very different than the way that Protestants did. In fact, part of why we are Protestants was to address that very question. And I've shared with you that as a little kid, I was always transfixed by what would take place, right? At the time when the priest would come to the altar, and remember, this is not an altar. It is the Lord's table. There's a reason why we don't call it an altar, right? Because we do not sacrifice at a Lord's table. Sacrifices take place at an altar. And good Protestants said, we're no longer doing a sacrifice. That's been done once and for all. Right? Jesus, our Christ, was sacrificed for our sake. It would be sacrilegious to continue to sacrifice Jesus over and over and over again. You may not agree with that, but that's what John Calvin said, and he's my hero. So, <laughs> so what do we do? And I, I shared with you that as a child, I would, you know... My parents would say, bow your heads, close your eyes. You know, um, that's when the bells ring and the priest lifts up the bread or the host and the chalice. That's when the Holy Spirit comes down. And as, uh, again, the Roman Catholic theology is that the elements actually become the body and the blood of Christ, which the Protestants said, we, that, that's not scriptural, it's not in there, and we just don't buy it. And we've been fighting over that ever since. But I used to peek, right? And uh, because I wanted to see what the heck was going on. And um, parenthetically, (laughs) I think as I grow older, I'm finally learning this lesson. That how important it is for us as adults to remember that all children are by nature Protestant. and reformers and they call us to look at things that we have institutionalized even the church and ask why Um, why are we putting chairs in the sanctuary (laughs) and I pray that we older reformers remember the lessons of our own history and know that we sometimes fight and die on the wrong hills right And sometimes, as the martyrs were burned at the stake, in some ways we burn our own children at the stake, figuratively speaking, for questioning and asking and pushing. So I think we're called as parents and children to walk the process of reformation together. Anyway. 
So, the Lord's Supper, we believe, serves as a reminder of, as the worship book that is used in Iona, Scotland, that I visited recently, reminder that God's love for us is made real in the incarnation of Jesus, right? The Word became flesh, the Word become flesh. It's a reminder of God's commitment to us, demonstrated by the self-giving of Christ on the cross. It is a reminder, remember me. It is a reminder of God's promise of new life for us, experienced through the acceptance of our weakness and sorrow, the forgiveness of our sin, and the life of the Holy Spirit. When, when I come to the table as I will shortly and as I will be, Pastor Taylor and I will be inviting you to do so. When I come to the table, I'm reminded of everything we celebrate throughout the whole church year. The waiting and anticipation of Advent, the incarnation of God with us at Christmas, Jesus' wilderness experience, his baptism and ministry, his teachings, his death, and his sacrifice on the cross. The power of God at the resurrection and the hope that that gives us for the world. And the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. But communion is more than just a reminder, it's also a reality. In the bread that is broken, the wine that is poured out, or the juice for our case, the life and death and resurrection of Christ become a part of our reality. We put that on. Paul talks about this to, to the Romans. We live in Christ, and our experience of life and suffering and hope are given a meaning that we may live by, by living in the reality and the meaning of Jesus Christ. Because Christ offered his brokenness in obedience to God's love for the world. We may offer our brokenness and know that so offered in love, it may become the means of new life for us and for others. The nature of that new life may be glimpsed in the sharing that we do with others. We don't go to the table alone. Yes, of course, we go alone. But we do so within the context of a community, of others who come to the table with us. There are no qualifications of age or race, success or wisdom. <laughs> I've got to pause here. I went to... The funeral service of a colleague, some of you uh, knew him, uh, Ken Wells. He served here in his retirement for a number of years as our pastor of visitation. I went to that service and I came home and Cindy didn't uh, come with me. She was preparing for our daughter and son-in-law to come and um, she said, guess what? And I said, what? And she said, um, uh, Jimmy Buffett. Jimmy Buffett died. <laughs> and, uh, and please, what I say next is, is not a judgmental comment, but you know, she started um, sharing me, with me the things that had been written about Jimmy Buffett, and hey, I've lost my flip-flop in Margaritaville, so. Um, <laughs> and then I started thinking, there's a, look at the juxtaposition between where I've just been uh, now, Ken's obituary is not going to be in the New York Times. Um, but when you listen to the things that Ken did in his life, um, they're equal in the sight of God, certainly. Maybe not in, maybe not in the eyes of the world. Uh, but we're taught, we're taught a different thing as Christians. Anyways, I digress. Comes with old age. So the nature of that new life may be glimpsed in the sharing that we have with others when we come to the table. You know, John Knox almost went to the gallows uh, simply over the fact that he would not kneel to receive communion. He refused to kneel, and it was part of the, uh, part of the church service, and they fought over it. My God, we fight over lots of things. But Knox insisted that we sit we sit at the table in order to receive communion. 
which would be a wonderful thing to try to do here, but it would take a little longer. So, there are no qualifications of age or race in Christ. There is no east or west, male or female, slave or free. Here all are welcome, and none more than those who know their need of God. Here, my friends, there are no strangers. We are all friends in Christ. And this is the feast that celebrates the kingdom of God. I read somewhere that one of the agents of real change is rehearsal. We rehearse the changes that we want to see come about. We act out this new behavior that we want for ourselves, that which we wish to eventually acquire. By acting in a new way, we eventually incorporate in ourselves the new behavior. We rehearse a new reality. The supper is this kind of rehearsal. Jesus calls us through his teachings, through his death and resurrection, through his entire life to rehearse something new, a new reality. And in so doing, we become part of this new reality and we transform the world. Rehearse forgiveness. Rehearse being there for one another. Rehearse kindness. So, as a small boy, the Lord's Supper was a mystery to me, and now years later, in a sense, it's still a great mystery to me, but for many different reasons. It's not the mystical aspect of the supper I dwell on now. It's not the doctrine of transubstantiation that is mysterious to me. As a good Reformed Protestant, I no longer hold it to be true. Now I come to the Lord's Supper in faith, in trust, truly believing that the Holy Spirit is active in and through the elements of bread and unfermented grape juice somehow. I believe that the Holy Spirit broods over the table as the Spirit broods over us and in the lives of those who come to share the meal. The mystery for me is that we are somehow changed, you and me, that our brokenness is somehow made whole, that our relationships are somehow healed, that we are forgiven, and that we become new. How does this happen? John Calvin, the great reformer, answered this way. Now, if anyone should ask me how this takes place, I shall not be ashamed to confess that it is a secret too lofty for either my mind to comprehend or my words to declare. And to speak more plainly, I rather experience them than understand it. Amen and amen. The Apostle Paul encourages us, do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord. In loving service to this loving Lord, we now return to God a portion of the bounty God has provided. I invite the ushers to come forward at this time to receive our morning offering.
Please join me in our unison prayer of thanksgiving and dedication. Almighty God, receive these gifts that we offer with grateful hearts and use us for your ministry in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. We who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members of one another. When we gather at the Lord's table, we are united with God and one another as members of the one body of Christ. You are invited to share in this feast. Christ prepares a place for you here. God is here. God's spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to God. Let us give thanks to God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. God of grace, we give you thanks and praise. Your word formed creation. Your breath gave us life. Your law taught us how to live. When we could not follow your ways, your prophets called us back to you. When the time was right, you sent your only son to die a death like ours, so that we might live a life like his, eternally with you. While he walked with us, Jesus fed us by his words, with his hands, through his love. Before he died, he shared a meal with his disciples, blessing the bread that was his body, sharing the cup that was his blood, urging us to remember that the life he lived, showing us how to anticipate your realm that is to come. Scripture teaches that on the night before he met with death, Jesus came to the table with those he loved. He took bread and praised God. He broke the bread among his disciples and said, take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body broken for you. Do this remembering me. When the supper was ended, he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God. He passed the cup among his disciples and said, take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is the cup of the new covenant sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Do this, remembering me. Every time we come to this table and eat this bread and drink from the cup, we proclaim the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. By your spirit, O oh God, make this bread and wine the body and blood of Christ for us. Feed our aching hearts, renew our hope in future glory, and send us out to proclaim your love, the love from which no thing and no one can separate us. All thanks and praise to you, O God, creator, redeemer, sustainer, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
Let us pray. O Lord, our God, we give you thanks for the bread of heaven. We have shared a generous gift of your abundant grace. Teach us to share our daily bread that all may have enough for each day and enjoy the fullness of life you offer. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. If you're able in body or spirit, please stand for the benediction. <clears throat> My friends, God's gift to you and I is the people who are standing around us today. Can you sort of turn around and look each other in the eyes? And let's do an echo benediction. You ready? My friends in Christ. My friends in Christ. I walk this journey with you. I walk this journey with you. As I know. As I know. That our Lord Jesus Christ. That our Lord Jesus Christ. Walks with us. Walks with us. Be at peace. Be at peace. Be not afraid. Be not afraid. And God's people responded by singing. There are goodies in the reception room and you're all invited to gather there.